Um, I'm Anna Johnson. I'm an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa in Belcourt, North Dakota. I currently live in Fargo, North Dakota, where I am a local artist. Um, that's what I do for fun. When I do professionally, I drive a dump truck. <laughs> so um, all the other stuff I do is is the real fun stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been living here in Fargo for a while now, and I really like being here in this in this area. So I look forward to our conversation today, and I can pass it to the next person that I see is Joe. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Williams. Uh, I'm a Wapetuan Dakota from the Sutton Wapeton Oyate. Um, yep, uh, born and raised in South Dakota. Uh, currently, I work at the Plains Art Museum. I'm director of the Native American programs. Um, yeah, uh, through the, the the Plains, I um, I curate exhibitions. I put programs together. Uh, work with local artists and community members uh, to sort of promote and. And help create a space for artists stories. Um, I have a podcast uh, that focuses on Native American artists and creators and filmmakers. Two guests are two of our panelists, so it's really great that they're here. Uh, the purpose of the podcast, though, is to um, tell Indigenous stories with Indigenous voices, not filtered through um, administrators, curators, uh, all that. Um, my that's my day job. Um, I'm also a storyboard artist uh, for film. So when I'm not here, I'm at my home studio uh, working on those projects as well. So uh, I try to stay busy and yeah. Uh, Anna, did you want me to pass it on or did you want to pass on? Okay, um, I'm gonna pass it on to Falcon. Uh, good afternoon to all. Um, my name is Falcon Gott and I am from the Sapotoyak Cree Nation in Manitoba, Canada. Um, I, my family transitioned here in like 2005, um, went to high school in Moorhead, Minnesota, and then just found myself in college at Minnesota State University of Moorhead. Um, I went for film production, graduated in 2015, and then I just happened to cross paths with Laura Youngbird, who was the then director of the Native American programs at Plains Art Museum worked alongside her and then ended up meeting Joe um, a number of years later. And so my, um, through that program, I was really able to explore and utilize um, my filmmaking skills and trying to help tell stories about like what was going on with um, the Native Arts programs and the Native artists that brought in. So I ended up making a good handful of short documentary films um, that conveyed um, their visit and what they were doing there. Um, I currently live in Minneapolis, Minnesota right now um, and, you know, pursuing and pursuing and continuing to create Native American type of narrative films. And so I'm looking forward to 2022 where, um, you know, where I'm going to explore that more so with, uh, with the Native community here. Um, with that said, I think, uh, I choose Caleb. Sego Sego Guego. My name is Caleb Abrams. I'm a Seneca filmmaker from Ohio, Allegheny Territory, which is uh, near the border of uh, New York and Pennsylvania. But these days I'm living up near Six Nations um, Territory in Ontario, what's now Ontario. Um, my background's in documentary. I produced, uh, I was the associate producer on the 2017 doc called Lake of Betrayal that looked at the impact of the construction of the Kinzua Dam. It forced the relocation of hundreds of our people, violation of the Canandaigua Treaty, 1794. Uh, since then, I've done mostly independent work for uh, regional Haudenosaunee uh, museums, cultural centers, things of that nature. Um, but uh, this past year, I have been serving as a consultant on the revival series of uh, Dexter, Dexter New Blood. The series is set near um, Seneca territory and features numerous uh, Seneca characters. And that's been a really um, eye-opening process to go from working so independently with, you know, 
almost exclusively indigenous collaborators working on a television show like that. Um, real learning experience. And I'm currently producing an independent uh, short called The Burning of My Cold Spring Home, and I'm planning to release uh, early next year. Yeah, I think I'll pick, uh, I think I'll pick Paulette. Sorry, next intro. What Guada would add to say what Guego, Gastotur Guate, Young Yans, Ganyage Haga, Niwakwanjo, da Danu, um, where he cofne Aze, Dana Oshwego, Tikidurun, Dana Ezuji, Wagatsununigan, Idoes, um, say Waguego. Um, hello everyone, I'm Gastotur Guate, Paulette Moore, I am Ganyage Haga, Mohawk, also part of our Hodinashoni, Rodinashoni Confederacy along with my cousin Caleb <laughs> um, and from Six Nations of the Grand River uh, enrolled there and I live both in New Mexico and at Six Nations. Uh, I'm a longtime filmmaker. I worked for a long time in mainstream uh, media, making films for National Geographic, Discovery Channel, PBS for the whole first part of my life and um, really did not see our own communities represented in any way that was um, beautiful and powerful. Um, and the films that I was asking to, I was being asked to make were increasingly uh, disrespectful to many different people. So I went out and became an independent filmmaker, spent a lot of time at Standing Rock, um, made films out there with Free Speech TV and um, spent time also in northern Wisconsin uh, with the Ojibwe as they were fighting what would have been the world's largest taconite mine and made several films up there right during the mine fight and then after the mine fight. And um, a lot of those films went also went on Free Speech TV. And now I have a media organization called the Auntie's Dandelion we have a podcast and it sounds similar, Joe, to what you're talking about, our own people's stories told from, our tagline is we are Mohawk women sharing stories um, about the beauty and the just um, power and teachings of um, indigenous people. So I'm very happy to be here with you all today. It's a, an important topic and of course one that's close to my heart. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Paulette. Um, I think that's all of us that's on the panel. I don't know if you guys can see all of the other people that are visiting or uh, on just to watch the thing. But um, so I just wanted to say thanks again to all of you guys for coming and participating in this um, first panel discussion about uh, Rutherford Falls and um, Reservation Dogs, the uh, TV shows. Um, one of the questions that uh, I didn't want to be too formal and give specific questions to you guys to answer. I thought we could have an open discussion um, basically about the differences or the similarities in the shows and because they're so they're so different that I think there's a lot there to talk about. Um, specifically that the shows are both created on different platforms and you know, um, with Rutherford Falls, it's, um, you know, it's on the Peacock app. Or per, I'm, I think it was made by Universal, so like an NBC sitcom with Ed Helms as the, uh, you know, like white savior to <laughs> um, kind of person in the show. And it's very, you know, sitcom oriented and, and light and not as um, serious as reservation dogs. So I think there's a lot there we could talk about. Um, if any of you guys want to start off with maybe some of your thoughts on the shows, um, I'll open it up to whoever wants to go first. And we do have um, an hour and a half. So you can take as long as you want um, discussing any of it, any and all of it. And I, you know, there's no real rules, so whoever wants to go first. Don't make me pick you. 
I can go first. I don't mind. Uh, so just some initial thoughts between the the two shows. As you said, Anna, I, um, Rutherford Falls is very much a sitcom um, and is acted out um, in a pacing. What, what I notice about being back in our own communities as opposed to the films that I was making uh, when I lived in Washington, D.C. for Geographic and Discovery Channel and mainstream media, um, it feels like the pacing always has to be almost um, redundant. Boom, 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 boom. You know, I think a lot about that pacing and how it's like bang, bang, point, counterpoint, ha, 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 cute, cute, cute. And um, that's the way that I feel Rutherford Falls goes. When I'm watching it, there's not... Uh, space for reflecting just from from that aesthetic alone um, everything carries the same weight I feel in in that um, and so situational as well I never really thought that much about what that situational um, sort of moniker means when you're making television but it's just like these situations and uh, all of it carries the same weight. All of it moves at the very same pace. All of it is color corrected, you know, kind of beautifully. And so all packaged up um, into this pacing that uh, doesn't necessarily challenge me. I don't want to just like kick Rutherford Falls in the teeth. They're working very hard. And it's amazing that, you know, indigenous people are in the writer's room and main characters and all of that. I give them, you know, what went on and to the people who, make Rutherford Falls. Um, and there's something that I noticed like in my own filmmaking when I moved from mainstream media filmmaking to filmmaking in our own communities. Um, I made a film, the first film that I made up in, in northern Wisconsin about this mine fight. I opened up, there was, it was most, it was an Ojibwe led action um, leading the rest of the communities up there, multicultural led by the Ojibwe. On that film, I opened that film with a non-Indigenous person who was not a major character. And he was like the white guy, you know, that was um, a very minor part of that mind fight. And when I look back on that as a filmmaker and as an Indigenous person, I'm like, how did how did that even happen? And that's what I noticed about Rutherford Falls. Boom, the first shot. It's not of the indigenous people. The first shot is of the, you know, white, you know, protagonist. And that's really informative. And I had to learn that myself. You know, it's like it's it's a compulsion um, that of unlearning the way that stories are told. And that was so deeply embedded in me because most of the things that I did with Geographic and Discovery Channel were military shows so uh you know so it's just sort of the way that my mind was working so that's notable as well and then on the other hand um reservation dogs that show just challenges me i laugh harder and sort of am moved in a much greater way because that pacing is different like from episode to episode and even from scene to scene Sometimes there are silences and it really honors the way our indigenous communities speak, the elders in our communities speak and how that invites you in when there are those spaces, those moments of silence and looks, and then you're invited into that space as a participant, because I feel like when it's that boom, 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 you're being told what you know, to think. Whereas when there's a little bit more reflective moments, I feel like that invites us in. And I feel like it's just so much more um, honoring of the way our own stories are told, the way that people tell stories in our communities and just even the material. I mean, we can go back, but those are, those are my initial um, thoughts is of of pacing and what that pacing means and the aesthetics that you begin with. So 
um, so a lot more. So maybe, mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Paula. Yeah. I think that was spot on. I think you're right about the pacing. And I, I think a good question would be, do you think that um, it's the platforms that they're on, like that specifically pushing the stories? You know, FX is so much grittier if you think about all the shows that they uh, have and what they're trying to do to make yes. things like a more authentic kind of way. And I think if you have a, the platform like Peacock or Universal, you know, they're they're very mainstream so i guess it's very um you know it's, it's so different that i think that that's why the pacing is like that too i think that's definitely part of it yes i i agree that that's right very very different platforms and what i do know about fx is that they were called out um for a lack of diversity a bunch of years ago during the course of the me too movement and the ceo was just like we got to do something and they they ended up uh, making a dedication to diversity in ways that that played out right away and paid out right away. Like it made their story so much interesting, so much more interesting. And, you know, the head of FX says himself, like we started to become way more interesting um, because of this dedication that we made that we were just like, oh, we've got to do the right thing, um, not realizing that it was going to make their platform better. So. Uh, I think that's, I, I think I could definitely tell that because if you think about when a, the show Atlanta came out on FX as right around that time, yep. and that show really changed, I think, the way that they were being perceived, like, you know, with the white, like there was a lot of, you know, Breaking Bad and The Walking Dead and all of those shows are great shows, but they're not, you know, they're very white centered shows. So, yeah. and I think when you get something like you bring out something like Atlanta, that just changes everything up and it, they, they, they show that they want to do more things with other um, diverse casts. And I think that, um, I think that Reservation Dogs will have some more life. And I think that, the, I don't know if both of these shows were picked up for second seasons, but they left off like mm -hmm. they were. Mm -hmm. I know Reservation Dogs was picked up for a second season. I haven't heard about uh, Rutherford Falls yet, though. But I, I think to both of your points, um, it's definitely uh, the, the pacing and uh, of both shows uh, it does reflect the intent, the intended audiences that they're aiming for. Um, Rutherford Falls, uh, it's it's an NBC production, so it's it's aiming for the general population, and so it's it's in, in large part it's trying to introduce the larger public to indigenous characters. And one thing I've, I've really enjoyed um, about Rutherford Falls is that they really touch on um, things that coming from the museum world, I can really relate to. Um, uh, the character, so I got a glance over, I wanna make sure I get the name right. Uh, Reagan Wells's character, you know, where she's this museum um, uh, director trying to be relevant, not just within um, the, the museum world, uh, but also within her own community, you know, being this college educated uh, cultural person, but doesn't really have the street cred on the res because uh, she isn't sort of mixing it up with with the kids back home. Um, and of course, they talk about the the, the corruption and the politics of the, of the casino world where I grew up on the res. Uh, I've got family that work all through the casinos there. And so you hear those stories and it's like, well, of course, yeah, that, you know, that's that's all relevant. But it's to an audience that probably doesn't know the story or how things go on the res and the politics that that encompasses those um, casinos. Uh, whereas Reservation Dogs, um, their audience is clearly indigenous people. Uh, there are inside jokes. There are things like, I think episode three, when they went to go see Uncle Brownie and you see the owl and they covered up the eyes. My wife and I just started screaming because we knew we know what they meant. That was so brilliant and so appreciative that they don't have to lay things out for us. They showed us an image um, and even though the eyes were, were covered, it was sort of a wink and nod to the intelligence of the audience of, of who they're telling the story to. And so um, I think an audience, the intention of the audience drives the story. And that's, I think, in my opinion, that's why there's um, this distinct difference in the storytelling uh, process in both productions. And I'd like to add on that, um, what Joe just said. 
like when you have heavyweights like Sterling Harjo and Taker Matiti, um, being able to have you know as much control as possible with 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 how these characters are able to to grow and develop and, and breathe in a sense in their environments, um, that's huge. And like like Joe said, that you know the, the target audience was definitely is indigenous peoples, and for us, I think that's that's very significant in terms of relating to those characters. Um, as for non-native people, I think that is an entryway to getting to know a type of like like what native people are about, especially in cinema, especially with representation, just because that opportunity or that platform is or rarely ever there um, in mainstream cinema, especially on something such as Hulu, um, streaming services that it's available worldwide. Um, but yeah, I think that's super important how, <clears throat> how, the, how Hulu has taken that, um, has taken that responsibility and showing that, that leadership to give this project to, you know, Sterling Hydro, take it with TT and develop something that was so just organically, just, I don't know, enjoyable, but also drives to the point about like sticking to like indigenous cultures, native people and targeting that because hardly ever have we ever, you know, seen that on, on such a platform. So, yeah. Do you think that it's that Rutherford Falls is was so specific? It is too specific to um, people who live on border towns within the reservations, whereas like Reservation Dogs was very, like you said, for Indigenous people, you know what you're looking at where you have that mix of uh, the white people in the casino and like, it's such a complicated storyline that I don't know if it's being told well enough, but unless you were like in a situation where you know about it, does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that, um, I, I give Rutherford a lot of credit for trying to tackle uh, some of the things that they do. Reservation dogs, as we were saying, uh, sort of knows who its audience is. And if you if you don't fall into that target audience, they invite you to try to, to to keep up, but the jokes might not be for you. And they're not really preoccupied with that. But Rutherford really does attempt to grapple with a lot of really big issues in, in one season too, I might add. Oh, and I want to say I did see they were renewed for a second season, so they will become um, like one of the things I thought, you know, I, I, I got through the first three episodes of Rutherford and I was excited. I, oh, look, there's this one. There's that one. It was exciting to see some native faces. I recognized or in the credits too. I'd be like, oh, they're writing on this show. That's awesome. Um, but I was feeling like the first few episodes were very much an introduction to non-native audiences into these conversations. And I felt like. I was getting a watered down version of things I already knew, but I knew that non native audiences were learning so that were hearing a lot of this for the first time. And it was very topical things about like the statue. That was a conversation that was going on. But I will say one of the most impressive and emo uh, highest emotional peaks for rather in Rutherford for me was in episode 4. Um, where, uh, Michael gray eyes, character, Terry, he's like. The, President or CEO of the, the casino. He's being interviewed by the NPR reporter. And the reporter asks him, how, how can you run this operation, rampant capitalism? How does that, how do you square that with your traditional Native American beliefs? And he pauses the reporter and he goes on this couple minute speech. And I was really impressed with Michael in, in that moment too, because it really spoke to this. It goes, it went far beyond resiliency. It was about the strength and the staying power and doing what needs to be done with the mind for the future. And I was really impressed. All of a sudden I was, I was back in. I said, okay, I'll try episode five. I'll stay with it. So, I mean, I agree with everything that's being said, but Rutherford, I think, doesn't have maybe as clearly defined uh, a mission statement. And it, pulls its, it gets pulled in a lot of different directions. 
it's trying to do so much. But I think Reservation Dogs knows what it's setting out to do and is really nailing it every step of the way. And I hate to, con you know, like compare and contrast the two, but because they both came out at the same time and we really have an opportunity to kind of to do that because of because that they came out this, around the same time. And I, I, I too, was pulled in by that um, speech he gave where he shut the recorder off and kind of laid it out for the reporter. And I, I was more invested. And if they if they can, you know, come back the next season with a little bit more definition i think that they were trying to do too much all at one time you know when you get all of the like you i of course want to explain everything to everybody but you can't do that in a half an hour sitcom in that only has i mean, I can't even remember how many episodes it had 10 or nine <laughs> like it's very little amounts of episodes you know for both of the, the series to tackle any of the topics that you're tackling in 22 minutes, you know, or 27 minutes without commercials or however long that really ends up being is a huge undertaking to do for any writer in any place. Um, but I was listening to um, Mark Maron's podcast, WTF, and he had Sterling Harjo on there where he was talking about not wanting to use his Indian friends to like get farther to get hit to get the show made and then FX, you know, brought that to them and said, hey, you know, we have an opportunity here, but he didn't want to um, be that guy. And I think that a lot of Indians feel that way about stuff like that, you know, where you're like, you're trying to get your story told, but you don't want to be like, well, I know this person and maybe they can help me, you know, and I thought that was really interesting to hear him talk about, you know, how he got it made and how in his process. So if you guys get a chance, you should check that that episode out. Which podcast was that? Uh, Mark Marin's WTF. Oh, yep. Yeah, he was. It wasn't that long ago, maybe last month. It was right after the show came out, and he had him on it right away, and and he talked a lot about you know how he got it made and the specific you know the, like how he catered it specifically for Indigenous people. That this is about you know it's partially about his life and partially about other people and what he's experienced, and I think it's important to you know for the director and the writers to have a say for things like that you know and like get, to get to be able to be interviewed too is something that not everybody gets to do when they have shows come out they don't get to talk about why their show matters necessarily it, it just goes out into the ether and you know it people absorb it or they don't so i think it's important to be able to have like these conversations about it too you know mm -hmm. So what did you guys think about um, Ed Helms' character as the, you know, as his character developed and finding out that he wasn't a Rutherford and that he, like, do you think that they'll bring him back in a different way to be more of a ally and less of a conflict, you know? he's He's a very difficult character to, like, and at the same time, they want you to like him. He's like the main character. So how do you, you know, how do you resolve that? I think in a lot of story developments, um, you know, characters will have sort of like the, the false victory, you know, so he might come around with a new perspective or something, but he's going to maybe fall back in old habits and continue on that in that role as, uh, as he has been in. Um, but I'm just, I'm trying to predict the future, so I, I don't know. Um, it, it would feel weird if, if they moving into just the second season, they changed the role of him so early um, within the, the, the structure of the rest of the story. I don't know. I don't know. What do the others think? What do you guys think about it? Anybody else? Yeah, I think that. Um, well, I know I know Ed Helms was. He was involved in like the creation of the show as well. He's one of like, the executive producers on it. Uh, you know, he's an NBC darling too. So I know that he very much, uh, I, don't, I suppose I don't know this. I, I assume that he was very instrumental in getting the thing off the ground in the first place. Um, and yeah, but he's, he's hard to root for, or he's hard, he's hard to like. Um, 
you know, I think he's playing, if anyone's familiar with the American, uh, The Office, he's playing, <laughs> in many ways, he plays a version of that character that he has before, I think. Um, but I think it goes back to, too, I mean, the, I think the show, my take on it is that it's the two leads, you know, Regan and I forget uh, Ed Helms' character's name. Um, but Nathan. Nathan, yes. Regan and Nathan are the are two leads, and there are intro there there are introductions to these two worlds that, that put, push and pull the show in these two directions. And uh, I mean, I'm very grateful that that Ed Helms was. Um, I, I'm glad the show exists, and all, all the complications that his character presents, uh, I think, speak to those the show's attempt to grapple with these issues about you know statues and the lineage and. and it gives them it gives them a lot of room to go forward in exploring other conversations in a television series. Whereas I think, I mean, I I, I see the characters in, in Reservation Dogs as being the vehicles forward, the characters. Whereas I think Rutherford is is, is sort of has their has their uh, pieces on the board in place that allow them to say, this one will let us go here. This this facet of uh, the town is open for exploration in a later season. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it. I think that it, I think that, um, like you were saying with Rutherford Falls, I think it's, it is an important show. And I obviously appreciate Ed Helms as well for being a part of that. And I think as an executive producer on his show, like he's probably got a lot more say than others and i think that when that happens then you as like as a person he's probably wanting to be like more in the main character spotlight of that situation so then i think they're pushing everything the storyline into this little like they don't have enough time to tell all of these stories all at once i like appreciate that they're trying to um tackle like all of these things but there's too many topics going on at one time it may be if focusing in more on like like if they just wanted to talk about the statue or if they just wanted to talk, like the casino and the cultural center and all of that it's its own thing too like they could be having five other episodes just about that and like what joe was saying about the relationship with like if you come in as an outsider back into the community after going to school and coming back that's a very specific perspective but it also could be tackled more you know like in um like different way it's just such a little part of everything in that show as the same with everything it's just like they go back to ed helms characters grappling with all of this stuff but they really laid it in there there was a i can't remember what episode it was where they were talking about um how he doesn't how he he doesn't understand they're taking everything from him when they want to make him like the mickey mouse of like the with the butter churn and it's just so ironic and his complete reaction is hilarious you know well i'm not this person and i'm not that person and it's like cultural appropriation at its finest but like spun on its head and i really like liked that episode and like what they were saying there you guys remember what i'm talking about where they were like this is <laughs> we want to buy you and sell you as mickey mouse Yeah, and I, I think there's an enormous amount of unexplored territory with Rutherford Falls as well about Reagan and um, Nathan's relationship of, um, you know, just that whole relational aspect of Indian country. If they've known each other for such a long time, it feels like... Um, I don't understand what they went through together when they were younger, right? So it doesn't feel like they've established that foundation of their relationship and what does Nathan understand about uh, Ngwe Hongwe people, Indian country. Um, if they've had that close of a relationship for this long of a time, like, you know, how does her family feel about him or you know it doesn't it doesn't feel like there's that establishment of 
the the basics of relationality. And for me, that's that's another thing that I kind of long for. Uh, one thing I do like is that they're speaking Mohawk when they're speaking <laughs> Ongwe Hongwe, so that's kind of cool. Uh, and and they're doing it pretty well, so that's that's kind of cool. Um, so the the depth of that relationality of knowing each other from back in the day, I would feel a lot more satisfied if I could see reference to that of how um, that under because it doesn't feel like. Nathan um, has a heart for Reagan's people, you know, it doesn't feel like that. And he doesn't have to, but how do you explain how that goes? You know, that relationship has been in place for such a long time and there's so many, um, there's not like a, a heart opening or an empathy or a reaction or really a knowledge of the way that things go, it's all brand new, you know, to, it seems like it's all brand new for everybody almost. And um, so that's, that's another thing that I feel like is, could be explored in, in a deeper way. And I agree with you, Anna, that it seems like they're trying to do so many things and even introducing the black mayor in what I want to know, that story too but it feels like another story and it's like how is that coming out of this small town um what role does she play in the context of all of these other actions that are going on like i would want to know that like when when they brought her into the mix i was like this is going to be really interesting to see the navigation of all of these different cultures but they're really leaving that from what I can see on the surface. And they're not exploring these different cultural ways of um, similarities, differences. And yet um, it's, it's fine to have a character for what they are. And they keep introducing her as the first black mayor of Rutherford Falls. And, and it's like, well, what, what does that mean for the whole context of... Um, of what's what's happening in the in the town, uh, I would just like more explanation because I think it could be really fascinating if they are introducing that. But it feels like, you know, they need a lot more time for all of those threads to interact with each other. They brought her in for a reason. How does she interact with all this, the other cultures that are happening that they're trying to develop? So, I think an interesting question would be why not have a longer show like a 40 minute instead of a half hour do you think that that is something based solely on you know like higher ups deciding that they only want to give them this much time to do it because i feel like maybe the storylines were made for something to be a longer episode because when you're because they're so cramped like you were saying about the the black woman you know the first black mayor they really hit on that a lot but i feel like there's something cut out or maybe there was a lot of editing and then how the editing was done just didn't make the story jive right because i feel like they kept it was like an inside joke that you didn't get because they were just talking you know what i mean so i think that's interesting um one of the things that i wanted to ask you guys about was reservation dogs is called reservation dogs and Sterling Harjo is from Oklahoma where they don't really have reservations per se. It's not uh, reservation systems like how we have here in North Dakota. And so it's curious to me where it was set at and how it was filmed. Um, do you guys have a take on that at all? It goes back to like the idea of just like relating to like a very general wide native or indigenous like audience. Like obviously I think it's a take from Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> um, and that once again, I think that's also another topic to be talked about um, relating to a non-audience. But the idea of reservation dogs, um, once I heard this story being like, once it was going into production and you saw things like pop up on social media about reservation dogs. That immediately caught my eye. Like, why is this show like, what is this show? Why is this show called like that? And as a native, like that instantly caught my attention. 
And so I, maybe that was possibly one of like the main reasons why they um, determined to call it um, reservation dogs, because it's a like an attention grabber. It gets your attention, especially for native people. Um, that's my take on it. That's also a good note that you said that in that region, there's not really much like <laughs> like a reservation per se. But um, once my again, my question is like, where are they? Hi where are they filming that at? Is it just mm -hmm. a bad neighbor? Like, is it a bad area in a town they live in? Because it's not technically a res. Like, I don't know where it was filmed at, and I did look oh. into the location exactly. But I was curious about that, just because of all the houses and the scenes that they're in. Is that just a bad part of a bad town? Like a a bad part of a neighborhood somewhere that they're just using as a backdrop to like blanket all the reservations that look that way, which is a little, you know, heavy handed then if it is, you know what I mean? So. It's a good question. I, I don't myself. I don't have an answer. I. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think of the layout of that town and how they've filmed that. Um, is there. Because there the episode with um, Bill Burr. Uh, was that did that take place in the same town or was that. In another town next door, because I mean, there's there's clearly a white community within that area too. So I mean, is it an open open res or what's? I guess I I don't know what the the the, the answer to that question would be. The, the layout of this of the town. And if it is based out of Oklahoma and they don't has the reservations, then it would just be a town with natives and white people, and not just be a you know, a reservation or whatever. And that's why it's a town with the white people in it. Like we're the, the meth guy with the choker necklace from the junkyard that that's got to be like part of that town too, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's yeah. for our interpretation. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> like do we see ourselves or if we're on the res, do we see that within our community? Sure. Maybe the idea of not naming the res is, is intentional. Yeah. Kind of like McGeezy, uh, Bobby Wilson, um, and uh, uh, keep blanking on his name. Um, you know, they're they're from uh, lower Minnesota and South Dakota. Um, you know, so I mean, they're you know, Minnesota communities, and of course, uh, um, uh, it's so embarrassed. I I'm blanking on his name. Um, Dallas. Uh, he's he's from my res. You know, which which is an open res. Uh, and so the white communities mix in with with native communities, you know. So, yeah. I do like that it's ambiguous, though. It's not specifically set, you know. Um, it kind of reminds me of um, Northern Exposure, you know, set in Sicily, Alaska. It doesn't actually exist, and it was filmed, I think, up in uh, between Canada and Washington back then. But you know, a mixed community as opposed to a border town and a border town. Sure. I'd like to um, jump on too to follow up on what uh, Joe was saying. That um, I know that Rutherford really has gone out of its way to create uh, to, to to drop us into a place, and it informs so much of the characters and the places that they come from and what they root for and what they're after. And like I said earlier, reservation dogs. Um, seems to be more character driven and they give us just enough information to have us give us a working understanding of where we are, but they don't belabor the specifics. And I'd like to connect that to the work that I've been doing on Dexter as well. That Seneca community is fictitious. I was, I was very insistent that it be a fictitious community and not be modeled after one that truly exists. And I also went out of my way to have the show not include any specific references to actual Seneca communities, because I didn't want it to be mired in any of the politics or, or 
uh, inaccuracies too. I just, it's a Seneca community and that's really all the audience needs to know. Um, and I think, I think that that, in a way is what we see in reservation dogs too. I, I'd have to go back through um, and pay more attention to what, what information they do give us. Um, because I'll be honest, I mean, I didn't really, I didn't think about that much when I, when I watched it. I mean, we're having the conversation now and I guess I'm, I'm trying to go back in my head and, and recall what was presented to me, but um, I, I think it certainly functions. Um, I imagine as intended as, as the creators uh, hoped it would, because um, it wasn't something that was, to, to me anyways, I, I didn't find myself um, confused about, and I guess it'll give them opportunities to flesh that out later if they choose to. Whereas Rutherford, I don't mean to keep picking on either, it's just they, they are different, right? And Rutherford, it, the large part of the show is a specific location, a specific nation, which is also, is all that, alluded to too, it's uh, the Minnesotan are not you know, an actual uh, nation, but they do speak Mohawk in the show, which <laughs> I am very glad that they opted to go with an actual indigenous language and not manufacture one. Um, I'll say me and my partner, we were uh, real excited when the episode when Terry's, uh, Michael's character Terry started speaking Mohawk at the, uh, <laughs> the land acknowledgement there. I said, oh, he's speaking good again here on there. Very cool. Uh, that part was so funny because he, you just, he spoke all the bad, the bad things in English. It was just so pointed where you're like, yes, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> um, I do have a specific um question about like the portrayal of on reservation dogs of the young adults in that show. Like, is, do you think that's a fair portrayal of youth? And is this something that we want to be you know, pushing as an, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but you know, like they're supposed to be, you know, high school to teenage kids, you know what I mean? And um, not all natives are like that specifically um, or have that experience as youth. So I don't, it's not, it's not as bad and it's not good, you know? So it's, is that the way that, is that the kind of representation that we want to see? I'm going to jump in on this and I'm going to say, yes, um, I, I worked with for years uh, with uh, junior high and high school kids and let me back up. Initially, I was working uh, the summer camps for the, these gifted artistic students who were there with purpose, who were very respectful and they were there to work and listen. And I went from that to working with um, uh, junior high kids and high school kids who were sort of like one step from going into the system. And I was a little shocked by their attitudes and the way they talked. And granted, I, I grew up on the res. Um, I went to tribal school for a while, um, all that. And I, I feel the betrayal is, uh, the betrayal, the, um, the, the way they speak in the show is spot on, um, it is, it is genuine. It doesn't feel like they're pandering uh, to us. And so whether good or bad, um, it's just, um, it is how it is, you know, and it, to me, it was a little humorous because they were getting it, you know, the, the way, uh, the, the one character just drops F-bombs after every time she talks, you know, it's funny because it's, it's how it is, you know, cause I remember my first interactions with some of those kids when they were cussing around, you know, I would say, all right, stop the cussing, you know, let's, let's be respectful. And they would just sort of roll their eyes at me. You know, three months later, they'd be cussing. I wouldn't even notice anymore because it was just the, it was part of the, the way they spoke. So, um, yeah, it was, sort of, it was kind of endearing to me uh, listening to them talk that way. That's, that's my take. I agree no. with you, Joe, that, um, I just love those teenagers in that show, like every single one of them. And, um, I love that. You know, in the one where I'm forgetting the character's name that went um, hunting with her dad. And she's the one that drops the F-bomb all the time, like all the time. And and so well, just like so just under her breath, just, you know, always ending a sentence. It's like the period. Um, and then 
that combined with the uh, super authenticity and concern and sweetness and understanding of just being there, um, that whole episode basically was out sitting with her dad hunting, you know, in the context of her cousin um, dying and missing him and all of these emotions that we're having and you're sitting with them. And I think that that's the other thing about Indian country that I just love so much is you sit with people and you spend time um, hunting or being with people. It's such an important part of that relationality. And there was such sweetness that isn't sicky sweet, you know, at all. It's so rough. It's this rough sweetness, but she obviously really cares for her, both of her parents, you know, and steals um, the the card from the casino so that her dad can give her mom a gift, you know. And then is it that young that young character? Is he named che- Cheese? Is that his name? Cheese. Yeah. So yeah. Cheese and. When he sits with the grandma, he, you know, he walks by her in the clinic and she calls him in and she says, grandson, grandson. And he's like, yes, you know, yes, grandma. He sits with her and continues that relationship. And that is so beautiful. It's like he knows that's his responsibility to sit with this woman who's not even his grandma, but everybody's your grandma. And I love that, that they keep coming back to that and he's playing chess with her. And then he finally says, you know, I'm, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm not really your grandson. And she said, you're not, but you are, you know, and it's like, she knew it all along, but she's bringing him in. And that like transfer of learning is going on that transfer of care and inclusiveness and, um, just incredible beauty that happens in the context of them actually living and not being like, and now we shall have a beautiful scene. You know, it's like, it's happening after she drops the F bomb like 15 times. And then, you know, here they are in the woods and um, another line, I don't know why I love this so much, but when her dad, tells her that he's seen the Sasquatch, you know, type figure. And she says with just so she's just so sure, you know, and she says that was I'm forgetting the cousin's name. Um, that was the cousin who passed and she was so sure. And and the respect that um, happens when somebody speaks like that, no matter who they are, or how old they are, it feels like that's so authentic too. He was, that was just what she said. And not, she didn't say, I think she said that was his spirit. And so, and so it was, you know, it's sort of like the grandma situation. Like he said he was her grandchild. And so he was, you know, so um, that kind of uh, embracing that magical realism as well, that our communities are so, um, good at it. and it's that comfort that can come from that and the power that can come from the interpretation of that Sasquatch coming she was so sure and that that made me feel really well I love that part yeah I I like the idea that the like the entire storyline is all native youth um I don't think that like like to see native youth on TV and to go about exploring their community in such a way and how they're dealing and handling and just even having conversations that are just like, you know, either they're just messing around or they're really trying to connect with each other. That's so important. Um, just because one, the, the lack of like native youth representation on, on film or on television is sparse, but also like, it's, it's one thing it's time we see, but like, also them interacting with the older characters. Take for example, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Gary Farmer's character. Like Nixon, like showing 
native actor that's that's well seasoned interacting with these new characters that are just you know starting and flourishing with their careers that's something that i thought about um like a couple of years ago that i think there needs to be more of that relationship in cinema and in film with the new up and coming native character um characters with the old characters um and just see how that dynamic and how that chemistry works and flourish within a storyline like say with res, res dogs like I think that's one of the reasons why Res Dogs is so um, is so successful. It's just because seeing those dynamics take place and seeing how these characters are able to experience such a situation, be able to reflect on it, breathe, and then go about finding a way to um, almost like resolve and gr and and that's one uh, another thing too that's important. Just seeing that character development seeing all these multi-dimensional, three-dimensional native characters um, in this chaotic way of trying to get off the res, like stealing a, um, a, 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 what is it, a potato chip truck and selling it, um, really taking like, you know, their, their, like, taking whatever means they can to help like end their goals, find, um, so yeah, to find their goals and, and, and to reach them. But through that chaos, they, I think they end up finding themselves. Um, but but boy like you know seeing how these characters <laughs> interact with each other um really jack she's my favorite character and she just kind of reminds me of some of like the people that i hung out with like when i was in seventh or eighth grade i was really into basketball there were a lot of other natives that are around me at that time and some of them for were from the res and living in the city and boy, did they sound, they had that heavy res accent. And um, I don't know, really Jack just reminds me of a scrapper, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and it's just like, I was like, in my opinion, it's good to see that, um, see that character take place. But then again, with um, Debra Jacobs character, um, like how she is going about dealing with the loss of her friend. Um, seeing that really emotional tone and how she goes about amongst her other friends um yeah that's it's 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 well written and, and cheers to like the, the directors and writers of, of of the show who who are doing that i might also add that i was also very surprised to see the some of the directors of the show like there's like obviously sterling hardro and then there was sydney freeland and uh, Black Horse Low, that was super cool to see his name, I think, on the screen at the end of the credits. And um, Te what's your name? Um, Tezba Chavez, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, I think they just did a really good job at, you know, displaying and conveying what these, what these characters are about and how they go about growing throughout the season. Because you brought up Devery Jacobs, um, I, I, I just want to like acknowledge her acting ability between the character that she plays on Reservation Dogs and then the character that she plays in Rutherford Falls. Um, you almost don't recognize her, not because she looks different, but because of how, how her approach to these two characters. Um, it, it, it took me, I, I did a double take when she was in, in one of the scenes. I was like, wait a minute, that's, that's her from, like, did not recognize her only because of her attitude, her approach to, to uh, the roles. Uh, a superb, superb actor, for sure. Uh, and along those lines, the Sterling Harjo podcast interview I listened to, he said that they had actually switched around the group of kids from the ones that they fought, those were gonna be the ones that were going to be the main character kids. So they switched the actors around for who was gonna be what when they first started um, deciding the characters for the show. And so all of like the, the girl that left with her at the end or lead, you know, she was a main, she was supposed to be the main character and the other ones that were in her gang those were also supposed to be the other kids, the kids that were supposed to be the main characters. So it could have been a very, very different show if they didn't pick the cast, if they didn't switch it back around and have the cast the way it is now. 
I don't know if it would have been as impactful. I mean, I don't know those other actors because we didn't get to see them as much, but I just feel like, like Joe is saying that, you know, she was an amazing actress and her range and ability is clear. And I think that that, sh that shows a lot. So it's interesting to think about what that would have been like if the characters would have been different. Um, and I think with, I agree with what you guys were saying about all of the, the children being um, authentic. I think authenticity is like what Reservation Dogs is striving for. Um, that commonality amongst natives that we all have experienced. And do you think that it would have been dramatically different if it would have been from the perspective of like, say their parents? Like if the parents were in the, in the, in the shoes that their, their kids were in? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a really funny <laughs> storyline, I think. Interesting storyline. But um, yeah, that's a really good question. I don't think I can quite see it as. Or like, you know how in like, um, or if, we're, if, the kid, if the kids were older, would it be as impactful? Like if they were, you know, in their thirties instead, or if they were at their, in their mid twenties instead of teens, would it be as impactful of a story? Or would it just be more sad? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, that's I as impactful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's impactful because they are so there's savvy and funny, like cuttingly funny and so savvy and so emotional at at that age. And to also have all of this background, there's so much backstory that is driving the characters. And that is so obvious that they spend a lot of time figuring out who they were before they they started um but at that at that point in your life i think it makes them such interesting characters because they're a little bit bound they don't have um the freedom just to take off right now or you know they they have to push and pull within the tension of being that age and then you know stealing a chip truck and then the relationships they have with these these guys at the um, at the junkyard too to have that like rapport with them makes it I think uh, really just rendered and and it really heightens it because they have so much uh, knowledge and uh, and courage and just uh, attitude <laughs> you know and that age I think for me it's like I see people. Um, you know, teenagers that don't have an Ungwehunwe, you know, original background in this way, and they don't necessarily get pulled back. I mean, there's respect for elders and things, but this, I go back to that story of of sitting with the grandma, um, that comes from an Ungwehunwe point of view that, you know, that there is this relationality. And um, I don't see that same storyline working in such a poignant way from a non ongoing perspective, but it is because he is that age. And a lot of times at that age, you know, what um, teenagers just become so self-absorbed, you know, in our overculture, there's that self-absorption self -absorption, um, to the point where they can't, can't see a grandma talking to them. And it doesn't figure in into filmmaking um, you know, we go back to to friends and to um, sex in the city, and it's like, where were their parents? <laughs> you know, where was who? Where were the messy relationships of and messy and wonderful relationships? And I think that those kinds of shows in the '90s and the early 2000s really had an had really spoke to the overculture of the time that you don't have parents you don't have to worry about taking care of them you don't have you know you just have to go to the coffee shop and interact with your friends or you just have to worry about just the four people in your own group and it's like where are these vast relational ways of being that push and pull on us um and so for them to bring 
bring that into the storyline for these uh, beautiful youngsters that are pushing and pulling on their own lives, I think is, is a stroke of, of genius. I think it would be different if, you know, obviously it would be different if they were older, but those were the reasons that, that I feel like it's so effective for them to be that age. I wonder if these characters, the, the adult characters, um, don't exist outside of the perspective of these of the youth. Um, you know, because the you know this show it's kind of like it captures like the excuse the pun, but the wonder years of our lives, right? Where it's like um, other shows of of kids this age, um, uh, Stand by Me. Um, uh, the wonder years, of course, uh, very, just a very interesting point in your life, uh, just to your point where they're about to, they're about to enter adulthood, you know, but they're still young, but yet their lives are very complicated. Um, I wonder what the show would look like on network TV. I don't think it would be successful. I, I yeah. think there would be too many studio types, uh, getting involved with all their notes and, and changing the, um, what really makes this something special yeah like they would make them change their perspectives on how they look and dress and act as teenagers because mainstream is not that I, the way that it is you know on the show I it'd be a disaster if it was framed like saved by the bell or something yeah they'd be know. like let's make one of them blonde and <laughs> like you know what i mean like, <laughs> a good example joe <laughs> it is by the bell it is, it is. And in speaking of that, I think that that goes back to why Rutherford Falls is so scrubbed because they're on Peacock run by like an M NBC and they're not ever going, like they want to be serious, but all of their seriousness revolves around love relationships, mm -hmm. which I also wanted to ask you guys about if you thought mm -hmm. that was weird that they just threw in like some random love relationships with the NPR journalism and her, journalist and her and then the mayor and Nathan like what was that did they need that was that necessary at all for furthering the storyline or is that just something to be like we're want to make sure you know we're a sitcom right do you know what I mean interesting what do you guys think about that I mean it it all feels very intentional to me it feels very much it's a product of the format that the show, you know, whether by choice or just circumstance, uh, is like. I think, you know, the the decision for the show to be a sitcom. I think, by virtue of that fact, I mean it's gonna it's gonna exist in like a twenty two minute, you know, format episodic format, and yeah, I mean. I, I don't know, you know, I, we're along for the ride, the, the, the love interest stories. I mean, I, I didn't see it coming, <laughs> you know, in either case, I mean, it, it feels, it feels kind of forced. It feels kind of awkward at times. Um, but I mean, like, like I said earlier, I do think that it was, it's, it's a way of giving the show options. To, and, and and to Paulette's point too about keeping that that pacing too, um, that or I like what you said too about <laughs> every every scene has the same they all weigh the same or something. <laughs> every moment has the same weight and, and it really feels that way. I I really think that really says a lot about that show. And and I'm not trying to beg on Rutherford Falls either, um, because I appreciate them and their platform and them being out there trying to do the thing too. But mm -hmm. like I like I think that there's a lot that could be fixed or worked on or made different or with Rutherford Falls where I think Reservation Dogs is more of a complete thought. You know, the writing is really solidly good and the characters are really well developed. You know their stories better. You can you you can even sense their background stories more and they don't even really give it to you that much. You know, if they had love relationships within reservation dogs, you could, you would be able to, it would fit in there better than I think the way that the, it is with the Rutherford Falls. And so maybe it is more like 
uh, structured like you would, uh, like just completely structured the way a scene would be in an episode for a sitcom. Like it's so structured in Rutherford Falls where there doesn't seem like there would even be that much leeway to, to improv in their situation at all. That it's like, we're just gonna get this done and then we have all this stuff in this one scene and we wanna make sure we fit it all in there. Yeah, I don't understand what, what the point of uh, of those relate, you know, maybe they have that planned for season two that that will come back. But as far as how that furthers the story, I don't understand what that does. And the, you know, it's almost like rom-com even more than like, you know, <laughs> than uh, sitcom. And to have to have that always as the anchor, like that's what relationship is, you know, that um, rather than this deeper understanding of relationships and um different ways that they look th through different people, through different generations up and down and connecting to and spiritual relationality as well. Um, There's just a superficialness there, I think on the surface of it. And I think that's that, palpable. Yeah. I think that's why, I think that's why we all kind of have the same issues maybe with Rutherford Falls as opposed to Reservation Dogs that it's it's all right there on top with Rutherford Falls. It's not like it's bad. It's it's obviously, you know, something that's good because we don't have representation like everybody else does out there. And so the more diverse representation, be it sitcom or like rom-com or, um, you know, heavy drama or dramedy or any of that stuff, um, you know, it's needed in all genres and all um, types of film and shows. But that I think that they they could they definitely have some work to go with the Rutherford Falls. And I think that the Reservation Dogs has got um, has it a little bit better because they are they have a more specific voice that they're going for. I, I, yeah. I think, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, just really briefly, just even the name, you know, to name it Rutherford Falls is not naming it an indigenous place, right? But it's so, um, that's such a safe thing to do. And then reserv to say reservation dogs, like that enters you into a grittiness and that enters you into, it It, it opens and expands your, the possibilities of, of what this show might be be um and then you know like rutherford falls just seems like it's very uh kind of washed already <laughs> you know sort of so i'll be very curious to see what it's like for the new seasons that come out and maybe next year we'll have the same conversation again but again <laughs> for the new seasons um do you guys have anything that you want to say specifically about either one of the shows? As we're getting closer to wrapping up here within the next 15 minutes, I want to give you guys a chance to um, say anything that you want about either of the shows or if you have any questions for each other or anything like that, just um, opening it up for you guys. I think in both cases uh, for, for both shows, um, they're they're different vehicles, right? Um, I think reservation dogs is something that appeals to me, and I think this panel because it speaks to where we come from. Um, it, it doesn't try to pander to us. It reflects, um, yeah, it reflects the worlds that we come from. Uh, it, it shows undefined relationships uh, with parents, with lovers, with family members, um, and I I think it also I, I agree with with the panel here. It's very smart that. It doesn't define one specific place because then that maybe would exclude a lot of indigenous viewers too. Because well, okay, that talks about that place. That's not where I'm from. Where, in truth, a lot of where we come from reflects. Um, it's, it's similar, right? Um, we all know, like I think where we all come from, there's um, maybe urban areas, there's country areas, you know, and so and that's all reflective on the show. Rutherford Falls is a NBC comedy. You know and that that's what it is, and I don't expect to. I, I don't expect the things from Rutherford Falls as I do from Reservation Dogs. 
I don't expect that hard hitting deep issues coming from that production as I do. Excuse me, I'm about to choke. <coughs> excuse me. Um, from that, and so I enjoy it for what it is. I do like though that they do touch on some issues that are important. Um, again, with gaming, um, with identity within communities. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm curious on where it's going to go, but I, I don't, um, I don't hang on to it as as heavy as I do with reservation stuff. Re reservation dogs. Oh, I oh. want to just say something really quick about Reservation Dogs' title. E e even the title of Reservation Dogs, the first thing I think of is those res mutts that you have running around your reservations. Everybody has them packs of dogs that either could kill you or you want to just take them all home because they're so sad and pitiful, like a Sarah McLaughlin um, commercial. <laughs> so it's like the first thing I thought of when I thought of Reservation Dogs. And I think that that it's like I'm not the only one that that thinks that and I think that that's another thing with reservation dogs that just gets people like brings people together with that understanding of other indigenous cultures all over that we're all different but still the same I wasn't trying to interrupt you Caleb go ahead oh, no no it's a good point um but I want to I want to piggyback on what, on what Joe said too um that's a good point I mean uh, Rutherford Falls is an NBC sitcom that was one of the flagship shows of their new streaming uh, app, Peacock. So they they want to put a familiar face at Helms and lead strong um, while also creating an opportunity for diversity or inclusion. And I, I think in many ways it succeeds in what it set out to do. You know, you can't I would you can't hold things against the office for not being you know, as pretty as a, as a breaking bed, you know, they're, they are different, uh, and they're intended to be different. Um, and they're totally different vehicles. So, I mean, Joe, Joe said a lot of it really well. Um, I'm excited for both to come back. Um, and I, I, am I have a lot of hope for, for Rutherford Falls because like I said, of, um, of, uh, Michael Gray, I speech in episode four, there were moments of, of real, um, Brilliance, I think I was really moved and, and impressed that they would do that so early in the series too. Um, and, and, and if, and if nothing else too, I mean, it is introducing these, these topics that may be well worn for us to, to non native audiences and raising the, the awareness and consciousness of those conversations that we've been having for decades, centuries and, uh, yeah, and, and, and lastly, I'll say too that I am really grateful that they came out, you know, within a few months of each other because it allows not only us as, as native viewers, but, but all viewers to have a sampling of, of two quote unquote indigenous shows. Uh, if we had to wait a year or two between one and the other, I think it would be easier for folks to write off the first as the, that's, well, that's what a native show looks like. As if there is such a thing, right? I mean, the possibilities are limitless, and I'm really excited to see not only where these two go, but what comes next, too. Paulette or Falcon, you guys got anything you want to say? Uh, yeah. Um, so with these shows and, and on, you know, more so reservation dogs, it, the show has definitely made an impact. Um, definitely made an impact, which is good because native people never really had the control of what we see on TV or in the media. You know, you go back in the beginning of um, film, like in the beginning of cinema, um, our representation was always controlled by someone else and it wasn't always for the best. So as the decades go on, you know, you see things like the Apache or like the Westerns, and then you get, you get, you get this show, you get, um, dance me outside and you're just like, Whoa, what is this? Then you get Powell highway and you're like, Oh, this is so much cooler. And then you get something along the lines of dance with wolves. You're like, all right, that's cool. Like, you know, this is a, you know, mainstream cinema, you know, natives are represented differently or more positively, but the idea that we're still living in the past. Um, 
like yeah. that was an issue and then you get smoke signals and you're just like whoa this is like the like a golden standard for like native for a native film and then you have this like i don't know what you call it, like a lull you see things here and there that you see films you know like drunk town's finest um you see things here and there that that pop up that are good but aren't just aren't getting the the type of recognition that they that they that they should have. Um, then you have say something along like Jeff Barnaby's uh, like um, rhymes for young ghouls, something edgy, something that, that 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 talks about a very important issue in history, residential schools, and that's a whole different other topic. And then you, we get this, we get reservation dogs, you know, something that's that I think is a lot that is accessible to a very large group of people, whether or not you're native or non native. And so to see what this show has done, and the impact that it has made, um, it's going to be interesting to see what comes from this. Um, and hopefully it's for the better. Hopefully when you know, on um, these studios or these streaming platforms, see um, the potential of what native people can tell. Um, and once again, I think when you give Native people money, they're able to do something that's very, very, very significant. That not only that not and only that educates like non-Natives, but we get to see ourselves in that. And so that's what I see with 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 what's like this this momentum of potential with 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 these projects, with these shows that are coming out. And so I just thought I'd add that. Yeah. Thanks, Falcon. I believe that we are at this time, when I look at the timeline of these shows coming out and thinking about Standing Rock and the other indigenous response to environmental degradation and how out on the, you know, out where you guys are in North Dakota, on the plains of North Dakota, indigenous people were it was the largest gathering of indigenous people in the modern day, right? The hist completely historic. And what I saw at Standing Rock were uh, the first Facebook live that I saw was Dallas Goldtooth actually with his nieces and nephews kind of crawling all over him for, at his auntie's house, right? In this really relational way, talking about the pipeline and how people were coming out to Standing Rock. That's the first time I ever saw Facebook live. And that was, I think a social media, you know, feature that was was meant for Ongwe Hongwe people because of the way that we tell stories. We need the context. We need to be able to not do it in little clips or bullet points or, you know, everything is context. Everything is relational. Um, for me, this really, I don't know that you can say that those things are related. For for me, it feels like Standing Rock and all of the stories that came out of Standing Rock and the fact that we were able to tell our own stories unfiltered, uncensored through this, like, Facebook Live and, and Facebook um, did a lot for us, I think. And to see, to drive into Standing Rock and see all of our nations, you know, they were like, by the time it was finished, there were 400 flags of the nations that came and put their flag in the ground at Standing Rock. And each of those nations were telling their story from the perspective of the land and protecting the land and what's important to us. So there was that whole, there still is that era where we're telling the stories, what is important to us as indigenous people. And I think a lot of people got to wake up that we're, at, we are actually here, <laughs> you know, that because what Falcon was saying, relegated to history, what we see on the screen is um, stoic, relegated to history, um, drunk, um, you know, uh, poor, drunk, all of these cartoon and or cartoons or romanticized, right? Um, so what you saw on the plains of North Dakota were our nations coming together and what we were doing was speaking our narratives, you know, in the way that we chose to speak them. And, um, you know, people did come out and fetishize the violence that happened there and fetishized, you know, the feathers and all of that stuff. But truly what came out of that was 
this knowledge, like we are still here. And so for just a few years later, for these shows to be coming out, I have a feeling that there's a connection for, you know, for what happened with the native people who came there and how our hearts were just so expanded. Our stories were heard and continue to be heard. And um, the fact that indigenous people are in the writing rooms and we're, you know, doing the um, directing and associate producing and, you know, Caleb is consulting on this major show. And uh, so what a beautiful time of rising of of these narratives that are so complex and really necessary in this in this time of technological environmental upheaval um our original stories are still here not as a sideshow but as a real key narrative that needs to be shared with and understood by the world so i'm just thrilled that these opportunities are here and I just feel like they're going to be growing. So, yeah, well. Well, I couldn't have said it any better, Paulette. <laughs> I just want to thank you guys so much for um, coming on the panel and um, talking about all these things with me today. Um, it's a good day to be indigenous. <laughs> so sure. I think we're going to uh, wrap it up. The They have another meeting going here in a little bit. Um, so again, I just want to thank you guys. Uh, hopefully we can connect again soon. Um, have a great Indigenous Peoples Day and, and go out and do good things. <laughs>